We've got a great ethics committee. They really like to help. We like to give good feedback to our researchers because we want their research to happen and we'll give you good um, advice to make it happen. Um, so research is, or ethics is not seen as a barrier for um, research here at Ballarat. So what I'm going to tell you about today is we're going to have three speakers. They're only going to have about three minutes each. They're just going to um, talk about their slides. They're going to talk about their projects. After we've um, heard uh, information about their projects, then we're going to talk about um, what research means to them, where it's come from, and where it's heading into the future. Um, right. Um, you might wonder why. Uh an orthopaedic surgeon for that is what I am, is interested in uh, the touchy-feely side of things. But I have a long-term research interest in uh, post-traumatic stress and, and recovery from trauma. And, and gradually over a number of years coming up, I've uh, been increasingly interested in really the flip side of the post-traumatic problems, um, where uh, post-traumatic stress is a minority problem after trauma, whereas the majority of people are actually resilient. And I'm increasingly interested in in what it is that uh, makes people resilient, how we can uh, measure it, predict it, look at it, uh, and just how much of an impact it has on patient care. So this is a small pilot study. We uh, looked at 100 people um, having orthopedic care, all sorts of things from uh, minor injuries to major joint replacements, uh, and took 100 people um, being admitted under my care uh, and asked them initially um, a few questions about their resilience. There is a, a, a questionnaire which you can use to, to get a number uh, of uh, a patient's resilience uh, and compared that with their functional outcomes and their ultimate satisfaction uh, with their care three months after we'd admitted them, um, which uh, can be seen here. So uh, it's really a common finding in all sorts of outcome studies that broadly two-thirds of your patients will be pretty happy with their care and a third will be relatively unhappy um, and that was pretty much as we found um, so that's interesting it kind of reflects what everybody finds but if you then compare that back against how resilient those people are what is fairly clear is that the patients who are satisfied have a resilience score that's a number out of 40 a resilience score in the region of the population norm 34 out of 40 is about normal for the general population but when you look to the people who were not satisfied they had a significantly lower resilience score. So uh, it seems fairly clear that people who are less resilient are less satisfied. And we took that a little bit further and said, okay, what does predict satisfaction after their care? And you might say, well, how well they've done after the operation, how their physical function is coming along. And the answer is, yep, that's important. So the physical score on the SF12 and their EQ5D uh, VAS give some indication, so a Pearson score over, over 0.5 is a pretty reasonable correlation, but what really counts is their initial resilience. The 7, a 0.75 score is really quite a strong correlation, so it is their initial resilience which primarily predicts how satisfied they're going to be. So satisfaction is more to do with resilience than it is perhaps to do with treatment success and is not really related to their health score. This is different from mental health and physical health initially, but resilience is really important. And there, I will pause. Oh, this project, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the um, people who conducted the work on this project, Kate Whittacombe, who's here today, Lyndall McNeil, and importantly, Natalie Hall, who just had her baby earlier this week, so can't be here, so I'm the filling. Essentially, we did comprehensive needs assessment and the number one priority out of that was access to rural allied health um, services in uh, rural communities. So as a consequence of that, we engaged extensively with the health service providers, GPs and private allied health providers in those areas to come up with a project that would assist. So we only had a small amount of seed funding and the project was to be a telehealth project for diabetes education by diabetes educators. However, Colac Area Health identified that due to the problem of recruiting 
allied health practitioners to rural areas. Often they were recruiting for a full EFT whilst they weren't funded for a full EFT. So in that, Natalie identified the opportunity to look at by having a multidisciplinary team that would be based in Colac, but would go out to those rural communities on a monthly basis together and work in general practice on an MBS model. <laughs> Sorry, I thought there was an slide. So we actually provided um, services in a range of communities. So it was Colac, Apollo Bay, Lawn, and Biragara. And this is actually the evaluation of that project. So it's been multi-phased. <coughs> it was very short in terms of the period that the project ran before we began our research and evaluation process five months, but what we did find out that it appears that over time we can make that model financially viable. It has um, potential in rural areas in terms of workforce development and retention. It provided greater consumer satisfaction with the services they were receiving. Prior to this, most of those people would have had to leave the community to access the dietitian or a podiatrist or um, indeed a diabetes educator. The service providers and GPs were satisfied with the model. Um, again, it increased the revenue for general practice, but it also allowed them to participate in the multidisciplinary team and to discuss client outcomes. Uh, the program reached its intended audience and the feasibility of the telehealth model it wasn't hugely taken up, so that's a further piece of research that we will continue to do. So in the short term, this has proven to be effective, but we still have to do more work on the financial model. And the other barriers are around communication. Who would believe that? And it's around the content in referrals and working with practitioners to um, <coughs> do complete referrals. But essentially, we are pleased with the outcome. Welcome everybody, my name is Simon Cooper. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about two, uh, I'm going to summarise in two brief studies that we've done of a total of eight over the last seven years around patient deterioration management, which is my particular interest. Um, and I'm going to particularly talk about this one study, which is about translational impact, impact on clinical practice relating to, to, uh, relating to simulation intervention. Next slide, please. Okay, so the aim of this particular study was to measure the impact of patient deterioration management programs, and the program is called First to Act, with specific reference uh, to the impact on nursing care. Um, as many of you all know, there's a body of evidence uh, to suggest that we fail to rescue patients. Um, with a particular study in New South Wales called the Soccer Study where they found that up to 47% uh, of patients had early signs of deterioration that we didn't identify. Um, because of that kind of background, I initially came from a resuscitation field, but my interest was around stopping people at rest in the first place. Uh, we've managed to raise a, a variety of sets of money, especially our OLT Office for Teaching and Learning to develop both face-to-face -face and web-based interventions in the management of patient deterioration. Um, for this particular study, we've done a, a, um, a series of uh, uh, quasi-experimental studies. And uh, the one I'm going to talk about in the next slide is looking at the clini clinical impact of a two-hour simulation intervention. Um, and you've gone one to step too far, but it's all right. I can probably remember what was there. Um, and the results of which was um, that we included 34 nurses from one department in one rural hospital. Uh, and we looked at, using time series analysis, we looked at notes review from before and after, which is a lot of work, um, around 258 patients with, uh, before and 242 after. And we identified significant improvements based on the two-hour intervention only, 
um, relating to the management of um, uh, vital signs, the charting of pain scores, improvements in oxygen therapy, and management of pain. So, in discussion, simulation, simulation interventions are known to have an impact. And in fact, in my field of patient deterioration, we've just finished a systematic review where there's 22, uh, 22 studies which suggest that even short interventions do have an impact on care. Face-to-face um, -face interventions, like the one I'm talking about, though, are very time-consuming um, and uh, challenging to get through. So we've also developed something called First to Act Web. Um, this is a software program that's available free of charge for another 12 months. Um, you can access it just by typing in First to Act Web into Google and it'll come on the first page of the, your, your Google search. That's what the website looks like. And if you just go to my last slide, Renee, thanks. Um, so it's probably too much to talk about, so I'll briefly summarise it and finish in the open discussion in a minute. But to date, the first to act web program, which includes at the moment three scenarios, has been completed as of this week by 10,000 participants across the world who have sat down for an hour and a half to complete the program. Approximately 80% are nurses, approximately 20% are med uh, medical staff, um, and all of which have had a good educational impact. There's been significant improvements in knowledge and skills having performed the web-based version. And I've been waved on the finish sign, so I'll stop now.